there's a good chance that you're paying for a few different subscriptions each month that you've forgotten about because subscription services aren't known for sending reminder emails. So let's fix that and make sure that you get a reminder email when you've got a subscription coming due. And no, this isn't an ad for Rocket Money or Trim or some other third party service. What we're gonna do in this video is take a look at installing an app in Docker called Wallace. Wallace is an open source, self-hostable subscription and finance tracker that lets you keep track of recurring expenses without the need for third-party services or spreadsheets. Now, just to be clear, this video is going to show how to use and install Wallace. We're going to do this via Docker, and you don't have to do this via Docker if you don't want to, and the GitHub page for this project has installation methods for a bare metal installation as well. So if you don't wanna do this via Docker, again, you don't have to, that's just how we're gonna do it in this video. And as per usual, the links to everything will be available in the video description. Looking at the Wallace dashboard gives you a quick overview of your expenses and lets you sort them by name, last added, price, next payment, and more. And of course, you can add new subscriptions with the new subscription button. So let's go ahead and click that. We can give our new subscription a name and either upload a logo or select a predefined logo that's in the system already. The billing cycle section lets you set how often you'll be billed for this subscription. Next is the payment method. And this is, of course, where you'll set how you're paying for this subscription. And there are additional settings for this on the settings page that we will take a look at here in a moment as well. What I feel like the payment method section is missing is the ability to add an actual account name or number to the payment method. Credit card is sort of ambiguous, and I'd like to be able to add something like Chase Freedom or the last four of the card so that I know which debit or credit card is being charged for each of the individual uh, items on this list. This could also be used to give more details on the statistics page that we will take a look at here in a moment as well. That said, there is a notes text field down below that I guess you could use as a workaround, but I'm not really a big fan of this as it doesn't really give us a lot of the extra functionality that the other way might. Next, we can categorize our subscriptions as entertainment, utilities, or whatever makes sense. You can also add, edit, and remove categories for your setup on the settings page, but again, we will take a look at that here in just a little bit. The next section here lets us choose who is paying for this subscription. Maybe your partner or your roommate instead of you is paying for this one. You can set up other people to get notifications as well as get a breakdown about who is paying for what over on the statistics screen. But again, we'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. Next, there's a place where you can enter the URL of the subscription that you're paying for if you wanted to do that. And then there's that note section that I mentioned earlier, and you can do basically whatever you want with this. But again, I've been using this as a place to remind me which card is being used for the account, which again, I'm not a huge fan of. If you've canceled a subscription, you can check the disable subscription box. <clears throat> and if you'd like notifications to be sent about the subscription, you can check the appropriate box for that there as well. Across the bottom of this part of the page, you'll see the delete, cancel, and save buttons. So be sure to use those appropriately. Once you've started building out your subscriptions, you'll see them populate the home screen and you can open them up and get a bit more information just by clicking on them. Or you can click the pen paper icon on the far right to edit the subscription. And that's about all there is on the home page, And I'm okay with that. I like the simplicity of the layout and the information that it gives at a quick glance. So with the home page and entering subscriptions, portion of things out of the way, let's dig into some of the other pages that we'll want to be familiar with. If we hover over our username in the top right hand corner of the page, we'll see a drop down menu. So let's go ahead and click on statistics since we've already looked at the subscriptions page, which is basically just our homepage. On the statistics page, we'll get a breakdown of our subscriptions, monthly costs, yearly costs, a breakdown of who's paying what, and that sort of thing. Now again, I'd like to see a breakdown of which specific cards in the payment methods that are being used here, but that would involve adding the ability to specify credit or debit cards in the payment methods section of this application. So now let's go back up to the top right hand corner where we found that menu earlier and click settings. Here is where we're gonna find our account details and we can update them from this page pretty easily. Next, there's a section called household where we can add people to our household. And once we've added a member to our household, we'll then need to just refresh the page so that we can then add an email address for them to get notifications of upcoming subscription payments. Now the next section is about enabling email notifications. And of course, that's why we're here. So if you want to get emails in advance for your subscription, 
check the box, select how many days before the due date you'd like to get your notification, and then fill out the SMTP information for your email service. Pretty straightforward stuff. Next, we've got our expense categories, and you can add, edit, and delete these for your needs, which I really appreciate how simple they've made this section. Next, we have the currencies section, and it is pretty lengthy by default, but again, you can edit this down to what you need for your setup. And if for whatever reason you use multiple currencies for your daily living, which I'm sure some people do, you can integrate a service like Fixer.io to help manage your exchange rates. The display settings section lets you choose between light and dark mode, as well as showing monthly prices for all of your subscriptions and converting prices to your main currency, which is kind of a weird combination of things going on there, but it is what it is, I suppose. Next, we've got an experimental settings section um, that I feel should be at the bottom of the page, but it allows you to, in theory, remove the background from logos that are in the image search. So I guess there's that. The payment methods section is next and you can enable and disable payment methods just by clicking them. But again, I would like to see some changes here. I'd like the ability to add my own payment methods and I'd like the ability to specify individual debit and credit cards, either by name or last four of the card for easily identifying what is paying for which service. Lastly, on this page, there's an export to JSON button that lets you export your subscriptions, but there currently doesn't appear to be any way to import your subscriptions, but maybe they've got that coming on a future release. Now, if we go back to the top of the page and click on the About in the menu dropdown, we'll get more details about the version, the license, and more of our Wallace installation. And lastly, there's a logout link in the dropdown at the top of the page, and it'll do exactly that for you. So now that we've taken a look at how to use Wallace, let's take a look at how easily we can get it installed. If we head over to the Wallace GitHub page, the first thing that we're gonna see is that this project is being actively worked on and maintained even as recently as yesterday, based on when I'm writing and recording this video. Now, if we scroll down, we'll get a bit more information about what Wallace is and some of its features. Again, links to all of this will be in the video description, so be sure to check that out if you want more information. Scrolling down a bit farther will give us different install methods, including bare metal, Docker, and what we came to use, Docker Compose. If we take a look at the Docker Compose on this page, it's pretty straightforward. We've got a version three defined at the top and just a single Wallace service listed below. We've got a container name of Wallace. The image is being defined as Bellamy slash Wallace with the latest tag uh, on there as well. We've got the ports configured as 8282 on the public side and port 80 on the server side. So if you're already using uh, port 8282 on a different service, be sure to change the 8282 here to something else, but do not change the port 80 that we already see here. There's just a single environment variable being used here to set our time zone. So be sure to set that to your specific time zone. And we've got two volumes listed. One is for its database and the other is for where we want to store our logo images for the dashboard. And be sure to map these to where it makes sense for your setup. What you see me do here may be different than yours. So just plan according for where you want to map your volumes. Lastly, we've got a restart policy of unless stopped, and that is perfectly acceptable unless you absolutely need it to be something else. So you want to make those changes based on what your setup needs are. Now, we can deploy this a few different ways. Our first option involves using the command line and using this method, we would SSH into our server, create a docker compose.yml file, copy and paste the info that we just looked at into that uh, docker compose.yml file, save and exit, and then run a command like docker compose up dash D and then wait for a moment for the container to come up. Now this may not be ideal for everyone, but I wanted to show it because I know a lot of people prefer to use this method. The next option is using Portainer. Now, if you're not familiar with Portainer, it is in itself a Docker container that lets us manage other Docker containers with a nice graphical user interface. If you're not familiar with Portainer, be sure to take a look at their website if you'd like more information on how to, how to install and use Portainer in your own home lab. But to show how to do it here, uh, we're going to pretend that you've already got Portainer and you know how to use it. So we're going to get logged in to our Portainer instance and then head over to stacks and then create a new stack. We're going to give our stack a name and I'm going to call mine Wallace. Next, we can copy and paste the Docker Compose into the text area on the page and then click on deploy the stack. After a couple of moments, the page should refresh and we'll be able to access our new Wallace instance. A third way to deploy this might be using a Portainer alternative like 
Dockage. Now, I made a video about setting up and using Dockage a while back, so be sure to check out that video if you want more details about Dockage and how to use it. Once your Wallace instance is up and running, you can open a new tab in your browser window and type in the IP address of your Docker server, as well as the port that you assigned to Wallace, and you'll be greeted with a screen that will ask you to create your user account. Once you've registered your account, you can start building out your subscription expenses in Wallace and get a better idea of where your money is going each month. So there is Wallace in a nutshell, and I'd love to know in the comment section down below what you think about it, and if this is something that you would install in your home lab and use in your day-to-day -day life. Now, if you've got technical questions or feature requests or those sorts of things, be sure to head over to the Wallace GitHub page and get in touch with the developers over there, as they'll be a better source of information about some of this than I ever will be. If you'd like to support Wallace, the easiest way you can do that is head over to their GitHub page and give their project a star. If you'd like to support the DB Tech YouTube channel, you can do that by giving this video a like or subscribing, or you can get ad-free access to my content by heading over to Patreon and becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month. But with all of that said, I do want to go ahead and wrap up this video. I want to thank you guys for spending a few minutes of your day with me today, and I'll talk to you in the next video.